So this is a slide that I've modified, but it's going to be where we start today. And I, I want us to recognize that one of the great things that we get as we walk out our relationship with Christ is hope. We, we go to the Lord that created heavens and earth, and we can find hope in every situation. So whatever your situation is right now or situations of the people that are in your family or your loved ones, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your great grace and mercy. Thank you that the kindness that you have displayed for us, Lord, is evident all around us, even in the rain that we saw yesterday. And Father, thank you that as we trust in you and as we don't submit to our own way of thinking and we don't lean on our own understanding what we're able to do is walk into this place of victory that you have for us thank you that you came that we could live a victorious and overcoming life in the process of walking out your purpose for us because you have provided for each of us a purpose and a destiny and lord as a part of that as believers lord we're called to be a part of a net. Help us to understand what our role is in that today and walk out our part as that strand in the net in Jesus' name. So we look at hope, which we just mentioned. But I, I want us to take a kind of a tour around God's desires for us and how he sees our relationship. And I want us to do that, and, 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 and on, on the other track, I want us to look at the way the world thinks about things and the plans that the world has for people. And I, and I want to tell you, if we don't surrender to Christ and we don't surrender to the will of Almighty God, I can guarantee you that the negative effects of the world are going to bear all of their all of their weight on you, and then you're going to be separated from God for eternity. That is not God's plan because God came down. The love of God came down in Christ. Unconditional, unique, unfailing, precious relationship. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. And thank you, Father, for directing my heart and my words and my thoughts to, to bring out the message that you have so that it's your word that comes out and your thoughts that comes out. And Father, I pray that my ears and my heart and those who are around would be open and we would hear what you have to say to us today in Jesus' name. Hope. All right. This is Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, I've got it on several of the slides that I have, but for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. All right. And in John 10, 10 over there on the, on the other side, the, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Okay, God has a good plan. And he states it. He's, I've given you a couple of different witnesses, one from Jeremiah 29, one from the Apostle John in, in chapter 10, verse 10, God has a good plan for us. And, and we even know what the toolbox looks like. The toolbox looks like over here in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight, living our lives in a manner consistent with our confident belief in God's promises. And we're empowered to do this but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Those are the words of Jesus speaking to his disciples. All right, so God has a plan for us and he has a purpose for us and he has empowerment for us. What are we, what is our role in all of that? We are to choose and, 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 and you can go back and look in, you can look in the writings of Moses and you can see Joshua and you can see people over and over making it very clear that we have to choose. We can choose the ways of God or we can choose the ways of the world. 
And I want to tell you, as we stand here at the head of the year, 5784 in the Jewish calendar, which is a, a year of open doors and God opening, supernaturally opening doors for us, we need to be prepared to think the way God thinks, and we need to put God's words on our lips and not our own. We need to take the thoughts that are our own understanding out and plug in God's word, because that's what makes the difference. That's how it is that we're able to walk by faith and not by sight. That's how it, how it is that we receive the power of God. We can witness and see the power of God. And then these things that we see, the good plans God has for us, the, the, the rich and satisfying life he has for us. And, and I want you to understand that that rich and satisfying life begins in your spirit. It's not with the accoutrements that you bring along with you and the stuff you have in your wallet or your purse or your cars or your house, okay? So we have to be, and I've talked about this recently, we have to be, we have to be divorced from the thoughts of the world. We have to take ourselves out of the world's pattern of thinking, no matter how logical or intellectual it may seem, and we need to be able to think about things and receive things and, and assimilate things and see those things made manifest because of our understanding of the Word of God, which we receive from Him. And this is from Ephesians chapter 4, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna walk into the fullness of what God has for us, we have to walk out of this world's way of thinking. I, and, and, I, and I wanna tell you, exemplified in yesterday's rain, um, I, I, there, there were the, there were the gratitudes of, of thankfulness for the rain, but then there were the, oh my God, there mud, there's mud everywhere. We're going to get stuck up to our axles. Da, 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 da. You know what? I, 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 and, and, and people proclaim and speak from the ideas and the understanding of their own head disasters into their life by things like that. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I, I'm pretty radically proactive about it. If I have an ache or a pain, I don't care if it's little or big. The first thing I do is I lay hands on myself because the Bible says I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That did not exclude me. So I lay hands on myself and I claim God's healing in my body. If it's a toothache, a headache, it doesn't matter. I take it to him and I, and I don't lean on my own understanding. Now, there have been times where in the process of him doing what he's doing, I've gotten my little bottle of Anvisol out or whatever it is and put on the tooth. But I want to tell you that I trust him and every time that goes away. Every time I've done that, every time I've done that, even with cancer, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you it goes away. Even with the side effects that I was told that were going to be extreme, they were, they were pretty tough there toward the end. But I want to tell you, God delivered me through that. Do you hear what I said? He delivered me through that, not from it. He delivered me through that. And when we're going through life and we're going toward the purpose and destiny that God has in store for us in our lives, he will carry us through those things. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me because the great I am is with me. All right. Now, that was warm up. Slide two. How can we possibly do this? What is that this I'm talking about? Whatever the big this is in your heart, in your mind, whatever the big challenge is that you're facing, whatever the big problem is, whatever the relationship thing is, whatever the physical problem is, whatever it is, whatever this is. And, and I got I to gotta retreat into another of this. I, I, we've been working with some people here in the community who the thing that they most need is Jesus Christ. And, and, and what I see them doing 
because they're not turning to and leaning on Christ, but rather leaning on their own understanding, is they're repeating the same stupid stuff over and over and bringing on disasters upon themselves over and over and over. And why is that? Because there's only way, one way to get out of this. There's only one way to get out of whatever that this is, and that is you must be born again. If the fears and the problems and the, and the cares of this world have burdened you, the sins that you've committed, thought about committing, participated in with others, if those things are on your mind and you think, I can't possibly get to a God who would die for me because of all the stuff I've done, let me just say this, that's exactly why he died for you. That's exactly why he rose again from the dead for me and for you. To show me that no matter how clever you think you are, or I might, I might think that I am, he's got the plan. And, and I, I want to tell you, we can go through life experiences, we can, hit, we, can get, we can get degrees of all kinds, and we can think we can chart our course, but I want to tell you, the ways, that, the ways that seem right to a man, the Bible says are oftentimes the end, the end of that is death. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. If we're going to get through this, you must be born again. You have to love and trust God. You have to be holy as he is holy. I know that's a big plate, okay? I understand it. I have to eat from the same plate. We all do. We have to love him with all of our heart. Trust him with all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding, no matter what the circumstance is. Oh man. And there's a lot I could just like get like really sidetracked on this one slide. But the point of this slide is everybody's got a this. Maybe several, maybe you've got a basket of this is. Okay. But what I'm saying is to you also is a lot of times those this is that this that you're carrying around is a heavy burden. And Jesus said. Come unto me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to tell you the world wants to burden us. Satan wants to burden us. He wants us to be weighed down so that we stay down and don't get up and go about the things that God has in store for us to do. But God has a plan. You know what? The word said we were up there in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. That's God's plan. Which plan are you in for? Are you in for the nobody knows the trouble I've seen plan? Because there are a lot of people who like that. You know, victimism is a real popular thing these days. Because if you can be a victim, it excuses everything else. But you know, I want to tell you what, in, in most cases, in most cases, the victims are victims of their own thinking and their own thoughts and their own words, which then express themselves as action and become destiny. That's not God's plan. God has a good plan, and he'll get you through this. And here's how I know. His word never fails. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. We just got some of that rain so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater and an opportunity for somebody to mow the cemetery. That's not in there. I just threw it in. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. I like that plan a lot better than nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Everybody's got a plate of troubles they can talk about. Everybody has had a burden. And if you go to Jesus, if you come to Jesus and lay your burden at the cross, you can walk away and, and be in that my burden is light. My yoke is easy place. 
Because Jesus will do the heavy pulling. Jesus will get you through the difficulty. I know that because that's who I lean on. I lean on Jesus in every situation. He's the one who has to see me through. He's the one that has to see me through. He's the one that has to see you through too. But I want to tell you why this big battleground is going on. And it was my favorite slide from last week, the Trojan horse. I want you to think about this. The Lord gave me a little bit of, of revelation. I'm going to go with, with, with Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 first. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Did you notice that, that, that both of those words were past tense, rescued and brought? It's already done. That's that song we sing, we're fighting a battle, he's already won. We need to think about that from time to time, for he has rescued us from, not just from going to hell. Did you see that? It didn't just say he rescued us from going to hell. It says he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. We're one of his children. Now, I'm going to tell you why that's important. Because just like that cross that Jesus was carrying and the one that we talked about, if anyone come after me, anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me, his purpose and destiny. That cross was a symbol of Jesus' purpose and destiny. And the difficulties and the challenges that we face are a part of that purpose and destiny, and we can allow them to defeat us and drag us down, or we can stand up and say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now, I was reading this, Habakkuk chapter 3, 19, from that ancient Eskimo prophet, Habakkuk. Doesn't sound like an Eskimo name, Habakkuk. I mean, you know, it does to me. Anyway, um, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Now, as, as I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking about sometimes in life, I've, I've done some rock climbing, and, and sometimes in life you find yourself in, the, in, in an analogous situation where you're just basically hanging on the side of the cliff with your fingernails and your toes and wondering which one of those steps you're going to take now and which one of those could drop you a few hundred feet real fast. You know, that happens in a day-to-day -day life. But, but I, I want to say to you, because of that first slide we talked about, the empowerment that you have from the Holy Spirit, God has good plans for you. God wants to give you a rich and satisfying life. We walk by faith and not by sight. I want to tell you that cross you're carrying, that purpose and destiny in your life that you're carrying, you're not done with it yet. If you're still in here and you're breathing, God has a purpose for you and he has a destiny for you. And his purpose and destiny links us together as brothers and sisters into a net from which God intends to harvest all of those who will come to him in this age right now. And sometimes we'll be taking our steps out there and it'll be a bit precarious. And so that's why it says there in Habakkuk 3.19, it says he, it makes my feet like the feet of a deer, enables me to tread on the heights. We are a Trojan horse. The enemy wants to take out every, the purpose and destiny we carry, just like the cross of Jesus Christ, the cross that we carry as we deny ourselves and pick up our cross daily and follow him. Walking out that purpose and destiny will do something for other people that has already been done for us. They will then be rescued from the dominion of darkness. And they will then also be brought into the kingdom of the Son that our God loves. I, I know some people, and, and you know some people, that if you were to be honest with yourself, you don't really know 
never really had a talk with them about God, or maybe you have and they don't care, and they're whatever, agnostic, atheist, whatever. You know, you can still be praying for them. Prayer, we heard about it earlier. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes people. Prayer captures hearts. I know my mom and my grandma prayed for me. I'm sure my dad did too, but I know they did. All right? And, and I guarantee you there were people praying for you even before you made the decision to come to Christ. We need to be praying. I, I'm, I, I was talking to Brother Vincent yesterday. Uh, we had some trouble. We were trying to connect for our, our, uh, our 8.30 in the morning Saturday call, which is like 4.30 in the afternoon for them in Kenya. Uh, and we were having a storm, so that meant HughesNet was out. And so we connected a little bit later, uh, about 1.30, which is close to his bedtime. And, and, he, and he said to me, he said, you know, we were out. We were going door to door. And, and we went to this this hut, the, the woman, the house I mentioned earlier, the woman whose house was in such bad shape that the inside and the outside, you weren't really protected from the weather. It was just walls and places to sit and stuff or lay down. Uh, and, and, and she was a witch. She was a practice. She was a practicing witch. And they, and they, and they witnessed to her and, and, and she repented and believed the gospel. And she said, you know, he said, he said to me, he said, pastor, you know, that, that a lot of times these people are just kind of their, their mother or their grandmother or their father or whatever was medicine man or which, which, and, and they practice witchcraft because that's all they know. It's in their family. I want to tell you, it's the same thing for us. These, these self-destructive, self-limiting patterns that we, that we walk into are, are the enemy's plan to reduce our effectiveness to reduce the effectiveness of us as individuals and collectively as the body. It, discouragement is one of his main tools, along with fear, which comes as a fear is what creates the discouragement because people start looking at the problem and making the problem bigger than the God who created all things, who sent his son to die on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and given a new life and destiny. I guess we've milked them as much as we can out of the Trojan horse for now. Um, I, I want, I want, I want you to look at this. These next couple of slides here. Jesus is again talking about going out, us going out and making disciples. And there was another scripture in here I wanted to touch, but where was it? Okay, here it is. This is about fruitfulness. We, we have a purpose and destiny. Why? Because God wants to bear fruit through us. He wants to bear fruit through me. He wants to bear fruit through you. He wants to bear fruit through us. This is the scripture from John chapter 15. And I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read all of it to you. Uh, it's, but I'm going to read, I think it's just verse eight here. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you. You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Who is he talking to? Who is Jesus talking to? If you can look in the mirror and say, not me, then are you one of his disciples? He's talking to me. He's talking to you. We are called to bear fruit. And that means we need to believe God whose plan is increased with a purpose that we produce much fruit. Now, as I, as I look about, there are all times, a lot of times you have, you don't know why you're going to have an opportunity to talk to somebody, but I was talking to somebody at one of the stores in town and I won't mention names because then you'd know who it was. But I, I was talking and she said, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sore and aching. I must be getting old. And, 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 and this is what the platform was. I said, yeah, <clears throat> I understand. But, you know, there are things you can do about that. I said, from the physical standpoint, 
I, I practice Tai Chi. And she says, what's that? So I showed her a couple of moves. And I said, it's self-defense in slow motion. But basically, it builds strength and it builds range of motion and balance and all those things. <clears throat> and I said, you know, and then in order to really have the balance, I have to, I have to know who my Savior is, and that's Jesus. And, and so I had an opportunity to talk about physical health and mobility and aging and pivot into a conversation about Jesus. It should be that natural for us. It shouldn't be something that we have to like pull out of our back pocket and read. It should be natural enough to know that God has a purpose and destiny for us. He loved us so much that he died on the cross. Jesus did. He suffered and died for us so that we could have our eternity with him in heaven. But, but we didn't just buy a get out of hell card free. All right, we bought responsibility. Our relationship, every relationship you're in, there are responsibilities. And so Jesus, in, in demonstrating how responsible God was toward us, even though we made the mess, we committed the sin, he died for us. And, and then Jesus lays this one on us. I think it's in John chapter 13. He says, a new commandment I give you. Love each other the way I love you. What does that look like? I wrestle with that sometimes. I wrestle with that sometimes. And, and I, think, I think we, we all do. We need to believe God. Let me back up here because I know there are a couple of others. Oh, yeah, this is the one. <clears throat> I, I got to tell you, in looking at just the slide right before here, Believe in God. Believe God. Okay. Um, I'm talking to Brother Vincent, and we're helping support him. We helped support him as he was burying his grandmother last week. And he said, and, and he, he, this, this guy is an on-fire pastor evangelist, um, and, and he just wants to go out and get the Word of God to people. He is the real deal. And and I'm talking to him. I'm talking to him yesterday, and I said, you know, um, the love of money is the root of all evil, not money. And and I said, what I'm going to tell you is that don't be focused on the financial needs that your ministry has, because God's going to meet him. And I said, there's a woman that we ministered to through him. Her name is Mary Mora, and she was taking care of her dad, and she's a She's also a college student, and her dad is in ill health. And so she's constantly online begging for money for stuff. And, and I told her, I said, look, I, I, I can't help you, but I work through local ministries. So we're going to bless um, Brother Vincent, and he'll help you out there with a little bit. And then, and then yesterday, I had an opportunity to tell her a story. I said, when I was a pastor of this church that turned into a homeless shelter, and I told Vincent this too, when I was a pastor of a church that turned into a homeless shelter, I got really tired of begging people for money, and I hated writing newsletters that sounded like, you know, a sob story at the end of every month, so I stopped doing it because I'm, ch I'm a child of the king. I don't feel like I should be begging if I'm doing God's work. I would go to churches, and I would speak, and they would give offerings. It was part of God's plan, but I stopped sending the newsletters. And you know, when you, when you take a stand for God, one of the things that you can rely on is that the devil is going to take a shot at you. Okay. So we ran out of food on a Wednesday night. We had a hundred people staying there. That's 300 meals a day. All right. A bunch of kids going to school, carrying lunches. Okay. We had a problem. So what did we do? I didn't write a letter. I didn't, even though email was available to me then, I didn't send an email out over the AOL um, modem thing that we had. I, we prayed. And the next day, amazing, I've told this story a million times, but every time it, it just reminds me of Jesus saying, the works I do, you'll do also, and greater works than these you'll do. 
because I go to my father. The next day, people drove up from all over the place, called us from local stores. We did not tell anyone. By the end of the day, I, my favorite one is I had a Vietnam vet who had the old Cadillac full of meat. The trunk was full, so full of meat, it almost sprung the trunk, all right? And, and so I have all this food coming in, and, it, and by two or three in the afternoon, I'm scratching my head and, and I'm trying to figure out my own understanding, how I'm going to store all the food. So God, who already had it figured out, had a restaurateur who was closing down his Cajun food restaurant and said, do you have room to store my walk-in cooler and freezer in your barn? And I said, would you mind if we use it? By the end of the day, we had more than a month's worth of food. Let me tell you what that is in numbers. That's 9,000 meals. God had enough for us to not only have all of those, all those people fed every day, but also to have a pantry for the community. God took care of it. Now, when, when I shared that with her, I said, I know that's a challenge. I know it's a challenge to step away from begging and asking for money and, and pleading for help. And, and I, I know a lot of people who do it all over Facebook and PayPal and all kinds of stuff. And some of it's legit and some of it, well, maybe not. But if that becomes the pattern for when they run into a ditch and they need help, what happens when the help is, that's needed is bigger than that? Who are you going to call then? You see, we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight so that we exercise our faith muscles. We have to practice our faith. We have to walk by faith, not think by faith. That's not what it said. Walk by faith. So as we encounter situations in our lives, what God is telling us to do is to walk by faith. And this is where I'm at right here. And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we request anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we request, we know that we have the requests which we have requested from him. I, I, I told people that I believe this, and they think I'm a little radical because of that. And they're probably correct. But I want to tell you, this is the kind of confidence and faith God is looking to build in us as we walk by faith so that we can have this confidence. I had just had the time of my life, the most fulfilling career, part of my career. Day, every day, two, I was teaching two Bible studies. I was preaching. People were getting saved. People were getting healed. People were being loved, and, and kindness was being demonstrated. And then the city decided they needed tax revenue. And, and I'm going, why, God, why? And he said, I got a plan. I've seen your heart. I'm going to see if I can take that fruit that you just bore, and I'm going to dig a hole. I'm going to put it down in there. I'm going to pack some earth around it. Then I'm going to water it, and I'm going to see what springs up. So he sent me back into work and business and ministry, and here we are. I'm telling you, I, I got to tell you this. This is really cool stuff. There's a company called uh, that does energy as a service, which means they they will buy expensive equipment and install it in locations, um, and pay the whole bill, and then they take a share of the savings for X number of years, so they make their ROI. I get an email from a guy named Fritz Christ this week. I had to look at it, make sure it wasn't Christ. It was actually Christ. And, 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 and Fritz, uh, Fritz's company um, is making a $100 million fund available for the installation of our technology for qualifying businesses. Now, we don't get any of that money until we sell the stuff. But just coincidentally, the date of the press release, or not, the date of the press release announcing this is the day that we're going to be in Phoenix, Arizona at the Phoenix Business Energy Expo 
Uh, and we're going to be able to tell people, hey, if you'd like to start saving 20, 30 percent on your factory building electric bill like right now and you don't want to pay for it, these people will pay for it for you. Sign here. And not, not, not only that, but something that takes like manually from an engineering math standpoint, two to three weeks in a good workflow basis, but usually a month to two months, we have people who are experts who are shrinking this cycle time for engineering calculations down to a matter of a few days, which will increase in, in the cycle time. Why is that important? I asked him for this on a beach 23 years ago. I said, Lord, it's going to take billions of dollars to get done what I see that needs to get done. And, and it's going to take tens of thousands of volunteers. He's already connecting us in countries around the world where we're going to be able to minister the gospel and here. I'm going to tell you something that's really cool because I think we're going to be able to do it. And I'm just going to throw it out there because he said that, that he hears us. So I've been asking him about this. So we're thinking about um, raising money to actually combine this concentrated solar power, uh, ac actually the heat from the sun, and, and capture that and run it through our system. And we're thinking about raising the money and, and putting it out here and putting a model out here in the DMR and, and providing electricity for everybody for pretty much free. Um, and, and then uh, we'll have to lease the lines from the from whoever, AEP or TXU. But the point is, and then we'll be selling them electricity because they'll, they'll need some of our stuff after summers like we just had. All I'm saying is, don't think whatever impossible outlandish thing that you might think that God can accomplish through whatever years, decades you may have left is outside of the bounds of possibility because I read something that said that nothing is impossible with God. And, and I'm going to tell you something else God's given me a, a, a vision for, and I'm not sure the location yet, but it's either just a little bit northeast of El Paso or it's over here in Lobo, Lobo and, and that's a homeless shelter that's run the way that we ran this here. And I know the guy out in Oregon who used to run the shelter for us was my, my kind of right-hand admin person for it, and, and he's available. So I'm thinking, you know, Lord, are you up to something here? If we... If we allow ourselves and we allow our hearts to think past the matrix that the world tries to paint for us, let me go back up to the first so you can see that we no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's not just religious doctrine. That's secular humanist doctrine. That's any kind of doctrine that gets thrown your way to try to tell you what you can, what your limitations are and what you can't do. If God has called you to do something, all he's asking you for is your availability. He'll do everything else. So I'm, I'm not even sure how long I've been preaching. Um, so am I in my limit yet still? Oh, good. I'm at 38 minutes. We still have time. Hallelujah. So anyway, I, I, I want to just back up. And, and maybe visit my little Trojan horse friend again for a second. If it was you in Jesus' place, would you have picked any of those 12? <laughs> okay. He picked you. Jesus picked you. He picked me. And, and why is that? Because he's, God has a plan. It's called redemption. Redeemed. I am redeemed. I'm, I'm set free from the sin and the guilt and the shame of my life. I'm set free to follow him and seek him first, to seek his kingdom first, to seek his righteousness first. And so are you. And so is everybody who listens to this. You're free to choose Christ. And just like, just like starting out on the journey, the only way you can even start out on this journey and hope for, hope for success is you've got to be born again. You need to invite Christ in. 
Invite him in to be your savior. Make him Lord of your life. But then, as you're looking for what it is, what are your dreams? A lot of times, God will find purpose in our dream, the dream, the, the vision that we have for our life, and then he'll use our passion for that infused with the Holy Spirit to bring about amazing things. For instance, I had no intention in the beginning or any part of my career of pastoring a church that turned into a homeless shelter or even pastoring a church. That was not where my mind and my heart was. But when he called, I was willing. The question is, are you? Come on up, Ruthie. Are you willing? Are you willing to do what the song said we sang in, in the early part of the service, I surrender all? Are you willing? I, I, I love singing that song because it, it gives me an opportunity to put my heart into those words. I surrender all. And, and even, the, even the vision and the dream that God has given me for ministry and business, I surrender all. This isn't anything I've done. It's nothing I'm doing. All I'm doing is showing up for work every day, and, he's, and, and even that, it's because of him. I wake up in the morning and take my first breath because of the favor of God. I, I, I walk into here and, and I, I know, I know what's going to unfold over the next one, two, three years. There's going to be a lot of turmoil going around the world, but God's going to use us. He's going to use us in a, in a big way right here in our community and, and, and around the world. We're going to be able to do some amazing things. But, but here, and I, I've told you this story probably before too, but I was, I was, I think it was uh, Zig Ziglar in his book, might have been, he tells a story about two kids that are walking down railroad tracks, which is kind of interesting because like I had railroad tracks like right down the street from my grandmother's house. I just had to go down the valley a little bit and there was railroad tracks. And he tells a story, he said, well, he said there's two kids walking on the railroad tracks. You got the fat kid and the skinny kid, each on a rail. Fat kid is cruising. The skinny kid keeps looking down, his feet slipping off the rail. And, and the skinny kid finally says to the fat kid, he says, hey, how are you doing that? He says, I can't see my feet. <laughs> I have to look at where I'm walking to. And that's where God's calling us. He's calling us out of watching our foot. Are we going to strip, trip, and, and, and fall and kill ourselves? With it? He's calling us to look out at the horizon. What's left in the year, years, decades of my life, your life? Because you don't know, we don't know. We could be here 10 years from now with a bunch more people. Who knows? God knows. But you know, we're never going to get where we're going. We're never going to get down that rail. We're never going to get to the destination if we don't just keep putting our foot, one foot in front of the other and walking down the rail. But if you haven't taken the first step, you don't know how to do any of the rest of it. And the first step is you must be born again. If you're listening to this and you've never received Christ as your Savior, I want to invite you to do that right now. And it's really easy. The word in Greek is metanoia. It means transform your thinking. Change your mind about your sin, the way you've lived your life, and receive Christ. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again, that he's alive today. And, and if you're listening and you've made that decision before, but your life has been challenged and you've made some steps that you shouldn't have, I've done it. My goodness, everybody has done it. Every Christian except Jesus, he wasn't a Christian, he was the Christ. You've, you've stepped off the rail. You've looked at your feet. You got your eyes off Jesus, just like Peter 
who was walking on the water to Jesus. He took his eyes off Jesus and was watching the wind and the waves, and he started to sink. And, there, and where was Jesus? Right there when he called out. Right there. And he's right there for you right now. I know that some of you right now are, are struggling with some stuff in the room and online. You're struggling with some stuff. Jesus says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Whatever it is that you've done that you think has separated you from the Lord, I just want to invite you back and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I repent. I turn my back on my sins. I turn my back on leaning on my own understanding. I turn my back on the enemy and everything that he has in store. And I embrace you. I believe you died on the cross for me and you rose again and that you're alive today. Holy Spirit, come and live in me. Lord Jesus, make your home in my heart. And Lord, teach me to be a disciple. That I can every day deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow you. And Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, for those who are dealing with illness today, I, I'm, I'm just praying, Lord, that just as I lay hands on myself, that if this, if I'm talking to you and, 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 and there's something going on with you, just put your hand on whatever the body part is. If it's somebody you love, go lay hands on them when you have a chance and impart this anointing. I, I almost feel it on my hands right now. Just release it. I release this healing anointing. Just put your hand on whatever part of your body. Father, I just thank you for healing. And stand. I just stand in agreement for those who have loved ones who need healing, physical, mental, emotional healing, whatever it is. Whatever the the... the name, whether it's, whether it's an upper respiratory infection or, or whether it's cancer, it's still subject to the will of the Most High God. We thank you, Father God, for healing us. And for those, I just want to enter your gates again with thanksgiving and praise for the doors you're opening for us. For the doors you're opening for us to bring the truth and love, not only to our household and our community, but around the world. Lord, I pray for leadership. I pray for the nation of Israel today in this, these final hours of Rosh Hashanah, 5784. Lord, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Father God, because you've commanded it and it is only my purpose in life to obey as you command. Lord, I pray that the light of Christ would shine around the world and that wherever miracles are needed, wherever those who have the courage to stand on the word of God and to, to look on to what we were just in with 1 John chapter 5. Having the confidence that if we request anything according to your will, that you hear us. And if we know that you hear us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests we've made. And so, Father, right now, <clears throat> your word talks about, ah, uh, thank you, Jesus. Your word talks about in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 8. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in keeping with this Rosh Hashanah that we're in right now. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. God is empowering people right now in this year, to the head of the year, the beginning of the year, to go through these open supernatural doors of purpose and destiny, of healing, of salvation, eternal life. 
We need only receive, trust, and obey. Father, we thank you because it's only by your spirit that we're able to do those things. In Jesus' name, amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives.